So our next so speaker, our next speaker is, uh, Dr. is Dr. Lika Guhathakurta from, from NASA, NASA. And, uh, and uh, today's, today's theme, theme is space, space weather and, and heliophysics. heliophysics. Uh, it, affects uh, it affects us every day, every day uh, whether you know whether it or not. You know it or not. Uh, those of you who uh, use GPS systems GPS or uh, need or, uh, that navigation to get around, get around uh, really, uh, really dependent upon, upon uh, activities uh, going on in, uh, in the space environment, space environment that, uh, that, uh, that are headed towards, towards the Earth here. here. So I want to so show, you, show a, you a little a video, video introduction, introduction uh, to uh, Dr. Lika, and then we'll get on with her presentation. So please enjoy this, and she'll be right back. I think NASA is one of those unique places, I would say, where you can make the impossible possible. Then you can dream of something and you can turn it into reality. My name is Madhulika Guhathakurta. I go by Lika. I work at NASA and this is my story. I came to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in 1993 to be a project scientist for a white light coronograph and in those days we had a mission called Spartan Mission, which would actually take a payload and deploy it from space station for 48 hours of looking at the sun and the solar wind. Today, I am at NASA headquarters and I have been here for almost uh, 18 years. And after I came to NASA headquarters, um, I led uh, this new initiative we got called Living with the Star. And this program is unique in that it actually looks at science, but looks at those aspects of this broad portfolio of science we do that is relevant to life and society. I grew up in India as a child and got my master's in India and then emigrated to US to do my uh, PhD. But I, I, I think it was the family environment where we, where we were always allowed to ask questions and never told you can't do something. And you know, I don't know, perhaps my grandmother had passed away and I was told that she's become a star in the sky, but you know, I was constantly asking my father this question, you know, where did we come from? You know, what happens to us when we die? And my father was, you know, did not want to shut me up. And he tried to kind of reason, even with a young child. And he would draw a circle and he'd say, oh, tell me, can you tell me that the beginning or the end of this circle is? Kind of trying to teach me logic without saying that some questions perhaps don't have answers. You have to work hard. Um, you have to respect people. You have to build relationship. You have to discuss and argue matters, not because someone tells you that you can or cannot do it. You have to have that core belief in yourself and continue to engage people. And be humble. Don't be arrogant, you know, that what I think is the right thing. I mean, I, I see the younger generation and there's just too much instant gratification. Life just doesn't work that way. You have to work at it. Be a believer in your true self. What you want, understand that, pursue that, pursue that doggedly. Don't be overwhelmed when people say, no, you can't do that. It's only you who knows whether you can or cannot. And pretty much all of us can do what we choose to do. Having that core belief in yourself is very, very important. Uh, thank you, Dave. <laughs> I don't know that before starting a 90-minute talk that I wanted to hear my <laughs> voice <laughs> for four or five minutes. Fortunately, at least when I'm talking, I won't be hearing myself, but you get to put up with me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again. <laughs> you know, this is, I'm becoming an annual feature, it seems like, and so is space weather. In fact, I'm just thinking, you know, why call it weather and climate? You know, why don't we call it space weather and climate? Because space weather contains weather, you know, and, and space weather also affects weather in some way. It's a joke, but maybe you should think about it, actually. So, uh, 
I was given a title by Dave, The Gateway to Space Weather, How the 2017 Total Solar Eclipse Revealed Our Space Weather Vulnerabilities. And I kind of changed the last word to connections. I think there are vulnerabilities everywhere. And I think what this eclipse has showed us are the connections that we have been building on in heliophysics and that we have been able to put together with this amazing gift that was thrown in our direction. So what you are looking at here is actually the eclipsed corona from August 21st, taken by one of our NASA-funded PIs. And perhaps you didn't get to see the corona with quite this exquisite view because this is image enhanced and you can actually see um, it is um, fine features that, um, <coughs> bear with me just a second. Um, the fine features are actually sculpted by the coronal magnetic field, the solar magnetic field that generates the coronal magnetic field. And as I talk today and after me, Bob, I think you are going to hear this word, magnetic field, magnetic field, magnetic field. That is the single most important aspect that separates heliophysics from meteorology, from terrestrial weather, um, many of the other signs that we do. On the other side, you see actually a picture of the shadow cast by the moon uh, from the vantage point of L1 from the Discover satellite uh, that is managed by NOAA and NASA jointly. While total solar eclipses happen about um, once every 18 months somewhere on Earth, and often it's over a body of water because that's what we have more of, this eclipse in particular offered the scientists, I think, a really unique opportunity as it fell upon a first world nation with a sophisticated infrastructure and a population that was really excited by the notion of science and citizen science. And there was a lot of citizen science. Uh, is the movie playing? Maybe not. Let me see. Ah. So this is actually a dramatic footage uh, that was captured by citizen scientists from a drone as part of a 360 virtual reality eclipse experience. And it's soon going to come to a theater near you, maybe a museum near you. And this is showing the moon's shadow sort of sweeping across the Grand Teton mountain ridge. And just look at the change in the color. Uh, there is something really primal about this experience for many of you who actually witnessed the eclipse. Uh, over a period of less than an hour, it gets dark. The light gets very, very eerie. The color changes, and this will play, um, you know, it will loop through so you can actually see it. And then what happens is that abruptly it gets 10,000 times darker in the last minute. And that's what sets it apart from a sunset every day, because we know the sun sets, right? This is kind of like that, but fundamentally different in the way it happens. This sudden blocking of the sun during the eclipse has a huge effect, because it reduces the light and changes the temperature on the ground and air and makes the ionosphere less ionized. These quick changing conditions can affect local weather. Some of you actually talked to me about it. Ionospheric va variability, animal behavior. I'd like to hear more from Jim Gandhi and the experience at the uh, zoo. And there are a host of other effects. There's no evidence that eclipses have any physical effect on humans. However, eclipses have always been capable of producing actually profound psychological effect from spiritual to psychotic. And I think most of us kind of feel that spiritual bonding. And so 
I think you have seen enough of this movie by now. Probably you can see a chase plane there. We have not been able to identify whose plane that was because it was not supposed to be flying. There is actually a dim headlight. You see one lone car uh, moving through. Did it stop playing? Just moving through this uh, valley. And just during totality, you can actually see that the car pauses for a few seconds because I think the driver is actually overwhelmed. I guess it won't play for me anymore. Don't, don't know. And, and then it starts uh, moving. There is, there is that uh, little bright dot, which is actually the headlight of a car. Um, I don't know how many of you kind of got to see this darkness, you know, in this kind of um, environment. Well, I, I don't think that any talk on space feather or heliophysics is complete without showing some kind of, uh, you know, prototype picture of the Sun-Earth connection as a proxy for Sun-Planet connection, and then further on, uh, stellar exoplanet connection. You are going to see this again from Bob, and so we are going to drive home the point, basically. And, and so, you know, we start at the very core of the sun, where uh, nuclear fusion generates the energy that we actually bathe in, which sort of, uh, you know, passes through the radiated zone, and it's the convective uh, zone or the convection zone where the real action for us in heliophysics begin, that's where the dynamo action kicks in. That's what generates magnetic field, creates and destroys magnetic field. And this magnetic field then uh, sort of surfaces up through chromosphere into uh, photosphere, where you see them as sunspots, dark, uh, strong magnetic field region, and a whole host of other features that I'm not going to go into. So what, what, what are the basics here? Uh, basically, the sun is coupled to the planetary system, whether it's our planet, as is showed here, or any other planetary body, any body, any, any object in the solar uh, system. And uh, what it produces are radiation, charged particles, and magnetic fields. And these, par these um, quantities actually vary uh, significantly on different time scale. And the most dominant one, sort of from climatic point of view, that we will hear about is the 11 year solar cycle, kind of the heartbeat of the sun. But of course, CMEs and flares, they occur on very short time scale. And so the study of heliophysics really involves three forces pressure, gravity, and magnetic field. And again, you hear the word magnetic field, which sets it apart from meteorology, which is pressure and gravity. Now, on the Earth side, you see that we are actually really uh, blessed in the sense that we have all this atmosphere surrounding our planet, which is what probably led to the existence of life. I mean, that's kind of what we are trying to understand. Is a magnetosphere a necessary condition for emergence of the kind of life that we know? And so we have, the, of course, the surface, atmosphere. All of you study that. We have ionosphere, plasma sphere, magnetosphere. That is kind of the domain of heliophysics. And of course, if you go to other planets or other objects like asteroid, they'll have different kind of environments and the interactions with the radiation, solar wind, magnetic field is going to be significantly different. And so this is really the field of heliophysics. And what I did here is I kind of wanted to give you also um, the connectedness of the heliophysics system so you can actually see, as I said, you know, we start from solar dynamo, which generates magnetic field, which generates all this radiative output. We have, um, and, and so what are, what are the electromagnetic uh, radiative uh, input to our atmosphere and the interplanetary medium? We have UV, we have visible, we have infrared radiation affecting certain parts of the layers of our atmosphere. 
we have X-rays and extreme ultraviolet uh, radiation that affects our ionosphere. We have energetic particles, either coming from solar wind or coronal mass ejections or um, solar flares, and they, again, affect different layers. And those lines there are essentially telling you how our system is coupled to different kinds of output from the sun. And that's why when we talk about space weather, it's just not one big thing. It is multiple uh, things that are happening in this system. And then finally, we have galactic cosmic rays at the very end. And you can see galactic cosmic rays is not part of our solar system. Galactic cosmic rays, which are very powerful, more energetic, and penetrating than solar flares, uh, are actually generated outside the solar system uh, from supernova explosion. And galactic cosmic rays actually come into our heliosphere and coupled to heliospheric magnetic field and modulated by the solar magnetic field. Uh, they carry with them really energetic particles. They couple with planetary magnetospheres. They create radiation environment. So it's very, very important also to keep track of galactic cosmic rays. So, you, you know, when, when you hear about space weather, it is very often we are talking about extreme space weather. You know, we talk about the granddad of all extreme space weather, which is the Carrington event. And we ponder what will happen if we had an event like that today. Uh, we talk about Halloween storms, so it's often associated with extreme conditions. What I want to kind of push here is the idea and the importance of everyday space weather. And Dave was actually trying to introduce. It is happening around us all the time. What are those things that's happening around us? How can we tell that these are the space weather environment we are living in? And so I'm going to kind of go through this uh, systematically. So of course, we live in the outer atmosphere of our magnetically variable star. Fortunately, we live under a sort of umbrella provided by our planet's magnetic field, the magnetosphere. So sun has a magnetic field, Earth has a magnetic field. And if they don't connect, then most of the time, the harmful particles are actually sort of uh, pushed around by Earth's magnetic field. But unfortunately, the magnetosphere always isn't a reliable shield. And that's what you're seeing in that movie. The movie is actually a numerical simulation of a magnetosphere. Now remember, magnetosphere is magnetic field, right? And magnetic field are imaginary lines, force fields. So this is a theoretical model, kind of giving it a shape, which is like a cocoon. Solar wind comes and puts pressure, plasma pressure. There is magnetic field connecting with the field lines here. And every once in a while, what will happen is the re uh, reconnection of the field lines happen. The field lines are aligned, sun's magnetic field, earth's magnetic field. And they'll propagate into through the magnetosphere, through the polar region, into the auroral oval, and creating sometimes beautiful uh, aurora, both in the south and the north. And there are many other effects that can happen, depending on how severe this ramp pressure is, how much the magnetosphere is squeezed. Not only Earth, but the entire solar system lives with its star. What we feel, other planets feel too, in a different way. And we are learning a great deal uh, from what's happened on Mars, uh, what's going on on Mercury. And it's fascinating, actually, because they are all different kinds of physics. These are all interaction of particular planetary bodies with the basic forces that is emanated through the uh, interplanetary medium by the sun. So what you see here is um, what in, in the lower panel, what you're seeing essentially um, are two uh, images from stereo spacecraft. And stereo were two spacecraft that essentially uh, drifted from the sun earth line and were able to actually give us a three-dimensional view 
of the solar system. So you can see uh, coronal mass ejections emanating from the solar sur surface is propagating all the way out. And you can see that big bright stripe there. It's, it's kind of saturated. That is our planet Earth. And it's going way past that. So all of a sudden, we have actually devised essentially uh, telescopes that is able to give us a picture of solar storm all the way from the surface of the sun past Earth. Th this, this itself is actually uh, pretty unbelievable actually to, to me, I will say. And you can see, of course, there is the SOHO picture on top. SOHO has been the spacecraft sitting at L1 since 1995 that has really sort of given us this view of coronal mass ejections propagating out. And you can see all the planets eventually which are bathed in the solar wind or plasma bubble. So this is kind of an interesting uh, chart, kind of looking at heliophysics as a universal science. We are still kind of trying to establish ourselves and get the message out. What is heliophysics? Sometimes it is, what the heck is heliophysics? The universe is actually filled with electrically conducting gas, that is <coughs> ionized gas you know, gas that have um, atoms from which electrons have been removed, and this is called plasma. Exceptions are planetary atmospheres where we reside. We are the exceptions. Think about that. And some dense interstellar clouds. So in essence, we live in a magnetic universe. We presume that most stars are magnetically active, like the sun, but the sun is the only star available for direct study. And so what we have done here is kind of trying to show you how to organize, perhaps, the universe. So there is gravitationally organized matter. There is magnetically organized matter. And I already said we are in a special bubble of our own. We live in a neutral environment. And there, there is tension between this gravitationally organized matter and the magnetically organized matter. So the gravitationally organized matter basically kind of leads to the domain of astrophysics, right? Gravity pulls matter, creates uh, planets, stars, galaxies. Magnetically organized matter, magnetic fields push matter. So it creates sunspots and magnetosphere, more our domain. And the tension between them creates a solar and magnetospheric storms. And that is the domain of space weather that we are trying to understand. So heliophysics became sort of an integrated discipline with the system science concept in 2005. We didn't have any textbook. We had books in solar physics. We had books in aeronomy. We had books on magnetospheric physics, but not the connected heliophysics. Well, we had to address that. And we actually created five um, graduate school textbook level heliophysics textbooks. And these are some of the topics. And you can see that these are complicated topics, all kind of combining magnetic field aspect spontaneous generation of structures and transients. You know, most of the space weather stuff we talk needs for us to understand that. Creation and annihilation of magnetic fields, dynamo, basic for planetary magnetosphere as well as solar magnetosphere. Explosive energy conversion, solar stellar flares, uh, coronal mass ejection, substorms in our geospace environment, all of this, magnetic coupling, you know, non-local, local, cross-scale, neutral plasmas. We interact with neutral plasma. And generation of penetrating radiation that comes from galactic cosmic rays, you know, uh, 
uh, anomalous cosmic rays, of course, solar cosmic rays, radiation belts, whole host of that. So this is, this, this is the area of heliophysics. Uh, sounds pretty complicated. It is complicated. And that's why it is kind of difficult to kind of generalize too much. Justification for heliophysics. I, I think um, we are forever you know, trying to justify ourselves. And this is from Eugene Parker uh, in 1958 in Cosmical Magnetic Fields. He was an astro he still is as an astrophysicist. And so let me read that. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that the development of a solid understanding of the magnetic activity occurring in so many forms, in so many circumstances, in the astronomical universe can be achieved only by coordinated study of the various forms of activity that are accessible to quantitative observation in the solar system. And so we have to work with every division, every discipline. And I think Eclipse actually uh, kind of contributed to this concept hugely. And this is from Murray Gelman. Someone should be studying the whole system, however crudely that has to be done. Because no gluing together of partial studies of a complex nonlinear system can give a good idea of the behavior of the whole. And I know you are familiar with that from dealing with metrology. So what are the heliophysics uh, sort of game changers that we came to understand post Skylab 1973, where we had an orbiting solar laboratory. We actually for sure knew we had already known that the corona is hot because we were seeing ion lines that couldn't be there unless the corona was at least million degrees hot. So we got to verify that the corona is hot and controlled by magnetic fields. Consequence, there is X-ray and UV generated which causes variability at Earth, especially ionosphere. High-speed solar wind generate, originates from coronal holes, you know, of the order of 800 kilometers per um, second. And solar particles impact Earth. That's the consequence. This is the one that was the novelist of all. Mass from the corona is ejected into interplanetary space. This is what we call coronal mass ejection, billion ton matter uh, expelled from the surface of the sun. Solar catastrophic events can impact Earth's magnetosphere. And we now, today, we know a whole lot more about this. And I know that Bobby is going to go in depth into all of this. I'm just kind of really touching on the surface. So some of the Effects, as I mentioned, are solar flares causing radio blackout, happens very quickly, traveling at the speed of light. Coronal mass ejections travel a lot more slowly as bulk matter can take few days to come depending on its speed. And that's the radiation storm we talk about. And then there's high speed wind coming from coronal holes, whether at the poles or at the equator, and they also cause geomagnetic storm. And you can see some of the effects of that. And so what I'm trying to portray here is the interaction of sort of sp how space weather interacts with Earth's magnetic field and how that dramatically affects the Earth in terms of impact. So space weather is sort of the outer space uh, equivalent of weather on Earth, if you want to think of it that way. Instead of wind, rain, and snow, however, space has radiation storms, as I showed, solar wind, flares, and coronal mass ejections. And the source of space weather is the sun. And that is, you know, some 93 million miles uh, from Earth. But they can make themselves felt on our planet. Strong solar storms can knock out power, disable satellites, and scramble GPS. It's a global problem made worse by increasing worldwide reliance on sensitive electronic technologies. And these technologies now are woven into the daily fabric of our life. 
And yeah, obviously, you can ask the question, well, hey, you know, sun's been behaving this way forever. Earth's always had a magnetic field. What's new about this? Why do we talk about it today? It is really our technologically dependent life and the sensitivity of technologies to space weather. So what I'm going to do is shift uh, gear and uh, kind of go from weather to climate, so space weather and space climate. That's how I would like to um, approach it. So this is, as I was mentioning before, solar cycle. This is a periodic change in the sun's activity, um, you know, which kind of manifests itself by showing sunspots, you know, and it uh, kind of goes up and down during solar maximum. The number increases during solar minimum. The number goes down, and you can see the intensity since 1760, it kind of varies um, significantly. Now, solar activity causes changes in space weather. It also causes a periodic change in the amount of radiation from the sun that is experienced on Earth and modulates the flux of high energy galactic cosmic rays <coughs> entering the solar system. So it's really important to keep track of the climatic nature of the sun as well. And so how do we actually study this entire system? Uh, we utilize uh, what we call uh, our heliophysics <coughs> system observatory. We have about 18 operating missions with 28 spacecraft. And then there are about five new missions that are coming up uh, that will be launched uh, relatively soon. <coughs> Gold is going to launch. You know, it carries uh, for ultraviolet imager for uh, ionospheric observation. Uh, end of January, ICON will launch another ionospheric mission sometimes in um, middle of uh, this year. We have Parker Solar Probe that is actually going to the sun. I have a movie at the end of my talk, which will be launching around July of this year. Solar Orbiter is another mission in partnership with uh, European Space Agency. And that got delayed and going to launch some, sometime in, probably in 2019. We have SET, which are just uh, small uh, sort of uh, detectors, you know, radiation hardened detectors that we fly so that we know that when we put this in our spacecraft, that they are not going to get fried by single event upsets, et cetera. So it's not quite a science instrument, but really technology demonstration uh, instrument. And with this observation, we apply numerical simulation, theory, modeling to get to an understanding of the system behavior of this system. And what this is showing is that as we have been launching uh, new satellites, like Stereo in 2006, that has given us the 360 view of Sun. Never before we had that view. We launch uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory that is giving us exquisite details of the Sun. We have SOHO, as I mentioned, since 1995. So with all of these satellites, I think uh, no matter which way a solar storm travels, the Stereo SDO SOHO fleet can track it. And this actually has allowed us to develop solar system-wide models you know, with uh, numerical simulation and ingestion of the data from these observatories. Now we can actually generate um, numerical models for the entire solar system. And there's a movie here. Uh, uh, you know, you've probably seen this before. This is an iconic movie from uh, Solar Dynamics uh, Observatory. But this is an ongoing um, effort. So interplanetary space weather sort of came into existence uh, follow on to the launch of Stereo and SDO. So if you think about it, at the dawn of the space age more than, say, 50 years ago, Protecting ourselves essentially meant protecting our assets on Earth. Now it means something much bigger. So NASA alone has sent probes to the far corners of the solar system. 
uh, you know, from Mercury to Pluto and beyond. We have the Voyager spacecraft actually leaving the solar system entirely. I mean, just think about what we have achieved. So to protect these robotic assets and the humans, who will inevitably follow? You know, that's the aspiration, at least of NASA, I know. Then we must learn to sort of understand and predict space weather anywhere, anytime throughout the solar system. And that's kind of what you are seeing here. This is a simulation of a storm, uh, 2012, uh, July 12. This was uh, you know, dubbed to be almost Carrington-like event. It didn't come towards us. It actually was in the direction of one of our stereo spacecraft. And therefore, we got uh, exquisite data, and we were able to model it. But this is kind of what we are doing in order to understand the environment. Very much like what the weather world, terrestrial weather world is doing in terms of numerical simulation, assimilation of data. We just don't have that kind of data. And that's kind of what, where, where we have to go. Um, and so what you are seeing here, for example, you know, the picture on the left-hand side right there, that's weather um, in the Midwest today, say, and that is going to be Washington's weather tomorrow, right? Now, if you think of the sun, weather on the sun today is space weather in low Earth orbit later this week sometime. I'm just making this up. But that's kind of the comparison. What you're seeing there are coronograph images. That is sort of our hurricane storm generator. And now we have actually created models that I just showed. And this is the model uh, right here. And um, we are actually able to take these observations and we can create, propagate it out. And that's what we are doing. So it, it is sort of, in a way, uh, very much, very close to hurricane forecast, you know, that tracks, uh, uh, hurricane forecast tracks uh, produced, I would say, by National Weather Service. That's, this is an attempt. So coronagraph uh, measurements are vital for this kind of activity. In fact, the recent leap in the US and the international community at large to generate a one, two, three day lead time for space weather predictions is critically dependent on real time coronagraph data. And probably Bob would talk a little bit about it because it becomes important for operational uh, needs. And so, What's the next frontier? The next frontier in space weather forecasting involves sort of uninterrupted tracking of storm clouds from the sun to the planets. And that's what you're looking at here. We were fortunate enough, you know, stereo was launched during a deep solar minimum, so we didn't get to track with both spacecraft that many coronal mass ejections. But in this case, what we have um, is it going to not play? Um, in the, so what we have here is we were actually able to witness this storm and then applying really new sort of image processing data enhanced technique, we were able to pull out the details of the storm. And what you see in the lower, um, why does it not play? Uh, what you see right here are, this is kind of, you know, we have put it in radial uh, uh, quadrant in order to see the storm and follow it all the way to Earth. And you are actually seeing evidence of tangled magnetic field. And the magnetic field is vital in terms of a really um, understanding whether a CME will uh, be you know, sort of a small time CME, whether it's going to have a large impact. It is all dependent on the magnetic field that is embedded in the, uh, in the uh, CME structure. And today, we get to kind of verify that 
only at L1, very close to Earth. But if we have something like this uh, stereo, then we can probably start figuring out uh, you know, the directionality of the magnetic field in the CME. So I'm going to shift gear again and kind of go into the climate uh, part and talk a little bit about solar cycle 24. And as uh, I'm talking about this, you're going to hear again about all of the, uh, at least some of this from Bob, just to set the stage to kind of give a perspective. In my case, I'm going to walk you through Eclipse, and he's going to talk about really all the impacts that we are trying to understand and uh, forecast. So what we have here is sort of the previous solar cycle and the current solar cycle. And I think I went up to something in October of 2017 and did not get the most latest data. So you can see that this solar cycle is already significantly weaker than the previous solar cycle. Furthermore, the last solar cycle had a very deep solar minimum. And the jury is still out on where the solar minimum is going to be for this solar cycle. And it is important, because when the sun goes through this period of ebb and the solar magnetic field dips down and we have a deep minimum, galactic cosmic rays invade the system. And so the radiation level goes up. And I'll show a plot on that. So I would say that uh, the new paradigm of interplanetary space weather that I was just showing sort of set the stage for it to be, I would say, cutting edge research on other planets too. And this is both sort of space weather and climate, right? I mean, we could be asking questions like, how do magnetic storms affect the density of the Martian atmosphere? Or how do cosmic rays and solar energetic particles influence cloud over Titan? These are important questions for NASA, at least. How do long-term changes in total solar irradiance alter surface temperature of any rocky planet? including our own. And these are questions that can be answered as we learn more about space weather conditions throughout the solar system. Moreover, I would say that uh, planetologists would tell us that we must answer these questions to get to the bottom of what's happening on our own planet. A little bit of comparative study is really uh, important. I kind of want to draw your attention to the next graph now. And what I have there is sort of uh, a plot of spectral solar irradiance. We don't hear a lot about that. And that has a lot of importance in climate research. And this ratio of spectral solar irradiance is uh, a ratio between solar max and solar uh, min. So if you look at the green line, that is sort of the visible light, right? And you see that the variation there is very small. It's like 0.1%. And we already know that, because if you look at the sun, we know it doesn't vary very much. But if you look at the blue line, and that is where you have UV, UV, and X-ray, that varies significantly. And that variability is not just a function of uh, solar max and solar min. It can happen on a given day. You can have a flare and the number can just shoot up. So we have to really keep that in mind and understand uh, you know, how that's affecting ionosphere, transport, chemistry, that kind of percolates down eventually. So if we look at solar cycle graph you know, as a xy plot, I mean, we are sort of drawn to the conclusion that there is a solar uh, max, it kind of stands out in all the plots. And then there is solar min, and as if nothing is happening in terms of space weather activities. And it, it's kind of human psychology, I think. And in order to kind of turn that around, I decided to put the solar cycle on a sideways map so that you know it's neither max nor min. It is essentially uh, two sides of great oscillation, you know, which I'm calling solar La Nina, 
that's sunspot minimum, solar El Nino, sunspot maximum. I, I'm, right now, I'm just being cute with it. Um, that's all. I haven't found any kind of uh, connection with the terrestrial phenomenon. But uh, these are oscillations, not on Earth, but actually on the sun. So the blue represents solar minimum, and the red represents uh, solar maximum. And if you, so I would say that solar, as solar uh, space weather uh, effects occur at all phases of the solar cycle, and you just have to look at both sides. They are different phenomenon. During solar minimum, we have increased galactic cosmic rays, and so more radiation for aviation uh, passengers or astronauts doing EVA. Total solar irradiance changes, dips, depending on how much uh, how low the solar minimum is. Contraction of the heliosphere because the magnetic field of the sun is weakened. Collapse of the upper atmosphere because not enough UV and UV is generated. Increased lifetime of space <coughs> debris. These are all important phenomena, and that happens because, of course, there's nothing to clean it out because the ionosphere has actually shrunk. On the other side, we, of course, know about solar maximum, all the things that happen, because that's what we talk about. So I'm not even going to address that. So next phase, right? You already know that Earth is protected from solar energetic particles by its magnetosphere, as showed over there. Showed you some movies earlier. Well, very similarly, the solar system is protected from galactic cosmic rays. Remember, they come from interstellar medium by its heliosphere. This is the magnetic bubble surrounding the Earth and the planets, the entire solar system, essentially, that is created by the sun and the solar wind magnetic field. This is kind of, you know, uh, sort of a magnetosphere inside a magnetosphere kind of situation. And so solar activity and cosmic rays, this is kind of important. So cosmic rays from distant supernova explosions and black holes are actually far more energetic and penetrating than particles from relatively small solar flares. When solar activity is low, magnetic field is weak for the sun, cosmic rays are able to invade the inner solar system. During the 2008-9 solar minimum, cosmic rays surge to record high levels, and that's what you're seeing here. And from all accounts, from the studies that I have seen, this number is very high and continuing to rise for this solar minimum as well. Yes. Kent Earhart from St. Louis. Um, are these cosmic rays as forecastable as the solar bursts are, and do they have the same kinds of impacts? So um, in terms of forecast, I, actually we are better off with cosmic rays. So cosmic rays are sort of a climatic condition, and we have measured them. So it is modulated by the solar magnetic field. So we have a decent handle on that. So we need to pay attention to the climatic uh, condition. Um, solar energetic particles is a different thing altogether. Uh, we can't uh, really predict them. We know that the frequency goes up where during solar uh, maximum, you know, frequency of occurrence of solar energetic particles, flares or CMEs. But it doesn't say anything about how bad a given solar energetic particle burst would be. So no, we don't have a good understanding. You had another question? You, no, these were the two, OK. All right. I'm, I'm very close to getting to the eclipse part. How am I doing on time? Oh, lots of time. <laughs> well, I've never had this kind of time, really. <laughs> so during periods of low solar activity, cosmic rays pose a threat not only to astronauts, but also to ordinary air travelers. You know, if you are a, a 1K a frequent flyer, um, you kind of receive a dose equivalent of 10 chest x-rays. And I'm not going to go into, you know, what that does to us. I don't know. 
but at least we, we are, have the knowledge to tell you that that's what's going on. And so what I'm going to do now, I have um, two slides where I kind of want to read this out loudly, even for myself. Um, th this is something I kind of put together a couple of years ago and have not broadcasted. Um, and um, I'm, I'm going to read this out to kind of really uh, describe at least what I mean by everyday space weather and how do you know that you have experienced everyday space weather. So you have experienced everyday space weather if you flew to this meeting, and I know many of you did. So passengers flying on commercial aircraft at only 35,000 feet absorb 30 times more cosmic radiation than people at sea level. You don't need to fly over the poles or during a solar storm because you'd get extra dosage then. This is the dose rate for mid-latitude flights during periods of low solar activity. You know, pilots are actually classified as occupational radiation workers. And if you fly too much, I think we become that too. So how many people experience everyday space weather in this way? You know, that particular reference I have there says 3.1 billion passengers per year. That's how many people fly. You have experienced everyday space weather if you have paid your electricity bill. <laughs> Worldwide power grids are sensitive to solar storms, okay? And we talk about hardening transformers against geomagnetically induced currents, training uh, operators to respond to storm time conditions, and smartening the grid. You hear this a lot, to react to the essentially shifting stresses of geomagnetic activity. All of these steps, of course, add to the cost of electrical power. Someone has to pay. So contrary to popular belief, big storms are not always required to affect power grids. They can affect it more severely, but there are many ways of affecting and stressing the power grid. Relatively minor everyday geomagnetic activity is important too. Geomagnetically induced currents far too small to cause a full-scale blackout can cause voltage sags, transients, and unwanted harmonics. This affects the quality of power and any equipment that happens to use such computer servers, telecommunications, equipment, you know, generators, and motors. And there's a study um, uh, done uh, a joint study by Zurich Insurance and Lockheed Martin uh, that claim actually some correlation with insurance claims and geomagnetic activity, and they ascribe sort of uh, everyday space weather economic impact number, uh, which is of the order of $10 billion per year. And so how many people in the U.S. Uh, use electricity? So that, that's, it's happening whether we know it or not. Oops. The importance of everyday space weather, two more items. You have experienced everyday space weather. If you have used a GPS tracker that Dave actually brought up early on. In the United States alone, more than 200 million people carry GPS-capable smartphones. We all do, pretty much. Runners, hikers, drivers, that is people from all walks of life use GPS navigation on a daily basis to measure their own speed, to find out where uh, they are going to, going, or to simply find themselves. We kind of have fun with it. Irregularities in the ionosphere caused by ordinary solar activity are a significant contributor to GPS errors. I know that Bob, I hope, will show some movies on this because a lot of work is going on in this area. And this error uh, is typically sort of 45 or 50 feet. Solar minimum is not a safe time for GPS, by the way. One of the most powerful solar radio bursts on record actually happened during December of 2006. You know, scrambled GPS system on the eve of the deepest solar minimum in a century. And we haven't figured out how or why. 
And then finally, of course, you have experienced everyday space weather if you are a space weather tourist. I don't know how many of you actually have seen uh, the aurora, but there are actually tourists, you know, and guides who actually go, um, especially to the northern parts to see uh, northern lights, you know, Alaska, Iceland, Scandinavia. And there is a cost associated with it. Now, the reason, I mean, the cost is not so huge for an economic impact to society. The reason I uh, sort of brought this up in this context is that these outfits do not rely on big solar storms. The auroras, uh, their customers come to see, are often substorms or quiet time auroras that occur when Kp is equal to 2 or 3. So even a bad night in Tromso is a wonderful thing, essentially. So these are some of the everyday space weather that we experience but don't think about. And now I'm going to shift gear and kind of go into what have we learned from the eclipse now that you kind of know, uh, you know what we are looking for. This eclipse was actually a great opportunity. But what you're looking at here is actually Storm Center produced uh, a video, again, of uh, the darkness, the shadow uh, in Salem, Oregon, at the clock tower taken by Gars. He actually had a camera mounted. And it's really wonderful to see the clock ticking. And I think the totality was somewhere around 10, 19. And you will see, it takes, takes a little while to get there. It will get there. And you'll see how it becomes absolutely pitch dark as you get closer to the time you are going to see the lengthening of shadows. It, it's just kind of mesmerizing to watch. I'm, I'm going to be quiet. Just watch this, because it has to get to 10, 19. And it, it's moving. <laughs> the, yeah, I, I was I, I was amazed when actually this was uh, showed to me right after the eclipse. In fact, um, I was with uh, Dave and his uh, team in uh, Salem, Oregon, and th this is this is quite amazing and different from the Grand Teton view of the um, you know sweeping shadow. Coming, coming. <laughs> you have seen this. <laughs> yeah, earlier you could see some of the cloud actually there. Look at that. That is pretty amazing. Okay. And so, um, as I am kind of shifting my gear to eclipse, I felt like I should probably also talk about my personal connection to uh, solar eclipses. And you know, when I was doing my master's in India, as I was saying in that interview, I was getting trained to be a cosmologist and astrophysicist. How I came into this path is uh, quite serendipitous. But of course, I found solar eclipse. Uh, very clearly. This picture that you are looking at is actually a picture from my thesis. This is the first picture of its kind. What you're seeing is an inset inside, which is a soft X-ray image uh, that flew on a rocket from LASP. And the white light corona you are quite familiar with was taken by High Altitude Observatory um, in Philippines for the uh, March uh, 1988 eclipse. And I was actually looking at the density structure. How does it evolve from the surface into the corona? This actually was published in uh, Time Magazine, because it was the first picture ever. And of course, now we have sort of dime a dozen pictures, right? We have SOHO, we have SDO, we have so many different spacecraft. And we can immediately actually kind of figure out what the disk of the sun looks like. So 
I have actually uh, led and been to about 10 eclipse expeditions. Um, so eclipse is a thing. And when about a couple of years ago, I was given the role of lead scientist for the eclipse, it was, um, it was an honor but a challenge at the same time. Because you know, how do you lead uh, an eclipse? It's not NASA's to lead. You know, it's a cosmic event. But I think we were able to actually put together a very compelling science program to support scientists to do interdisciplinary science, to really kind of understand heliophysics and comparative heliophysics and opened up new avenues. And it's not done yet. There's a lot more data that need to be analyzed. And so what you're looking here is um, you know, a view from sort of the NASA perspective. And I would say from a NASA perspective, I don't think there has been any other single event uh, that has informed so many scientific endeavors that are now the subject of so much of its work. Solar dynamics, heliophysics, earth science, astrobiology, planetary science, and many more. The eclipse actually provided unprecedented opportunity for these cross-disciplinary studies um, of the sun, moon, earth, and their interactions. And so NASA supported research using balloons. We had 55 of those kind of uh, strewn across. I'll let me play that again if I can. And um, we had airplanes. We had ground-based telescope of every kind that we can imagine. There were about a dozen of NASA, NOAA, ESA, JAXA spacecraft that observed the sun, earth, moon alignment during the eclipse. And all this while, of course, scientists who study eclipses were just essentially buzzing around, you know, setting their equipment to take the measurements of the sun, its atmosphere, and its interaction with our own atmosphere. And there is a wealth of data that has been collected actually of atmospheric uh, measurements uh, during this eclipse. And all of this with a singular goal, you know, and even that sort of inspired a unique sense of cosmic communion also attempted to answer the burning question, and forgive my pun, you know, why is the corona so hot and uh, what accelerates the solar wind because we are looking at the outer atmosphere of the sun. What you're looking at here is uh, NASA's public engagement activity. Um, it is not far-fetched to say that NASA has not seen this kind of engagement in anything it has done. NASA's solar eclipse coverage was the agency's most watched and most followed event on social media to date, and it breaks all kinds of records, literally, uh, with the largest media reach of over a few billion. And this is from all over. And what you see here are uh, many NASA TV studios that were set up along the path of uh, totality, NASA airplane that uh, flew from Armstrong carrying experiments as well as our associate administrator for science and ad uh, acting administrator for NASA on that plane. And very cool. It didn't go that far, but of course, you know, we streamed the video. Maybe that's kind of what that um, signal is trying to show. And then, of course, we had museums and uh, uh, other um, you know, scientific organizations participating in this activity. Th this, this was quite the show, I would say. I, I actually have not seen that 90-minute uh, video that NASA has produced. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, what they covered in that. And then we get this. Heliophysics gets his day in the sun at eclipse hearing. I mean, imagine that. The House Science Committee held a joint subcommittee hearing on September 28, dedicated 
to the total solar eclipse that traversed the U.S. Committee members from both parties marveled at the widespread interest in the event and conversed with witnesses from the scientific community about public outreach efforts, heliophysics, and space weather preparedness. Yet again, and discussions, you know, of course, turned to space weather because you can't talk about heliophysics, solar eclipse without space weather. Uh, discussion of the sun's corona also provided hearing participants with the opportunity to discuss space weather hazards. And maybe Bob will talk more about this in May. The Senate passed the Space Weather Research and Forecasting Act. So there are a lot of activities going on. Eclipse was a prime opportunity for STEM outreach. And I think we have to kind of keep this momentum for the upcoming eclipse in 2024. So NASA uh, funded 11 science uh, experiments, essentially, uh, throughout uh, uh, the United States. And they, they were sort of um, compartmentalized into three subcategory, I would say. One that looked at the inner solar corona, because that's what is absolutely inaccessible in any other way but for a total solar eclipse. And that region, the very beginning part of the solar corona, is sort of the missing link, the region where space weather is formed, where the corona gets heated, uh, where the solar wind gets accelerated, and a region that we don't have access to. So there were five experiments kind of really delving into the details of the solar coronal study, uh, utilizing every kind of uh, sort of telescope you can imagine you know, looking at wave measurement, uh, looking at spectral information, looking at velocity, density, magnetic field, diagnostic, looking at infrared band that we haven't looked at before. It, it, it was uh, quite amazing. And doing this from ground, from airplane, wherever they could, and sometimes, you know, sort of strewn along the path of totality either to increase sort of redundancy or to collect more data because the eclipse was 90 minutes uh, long. And the next category is um, essentially the ionospheric science. And there were three experiments there where most of the activity was actually validating models. And it is really important to validate models utilizing sort of uh, good constraints because we need uh, good ionospheric models uh, for uh, forecasting and prediction. And the third category is atmospheric, basically. You know, all kinds of work has gone on. And uh, some that actually looked at um, Earth's radiation budget, and I will kind of talk about that a uh, little bit more. So quickly. I'm going to go through this fast because I have kind of given you, uh, uh, you know, what we are looking for, what the goals are, and these are different kinds of telescopes that are taking different uh, measurements. So this is this is a, a spectrometer, imaging spectrometer, you know, looking at chemical composition and uh, electron temperature distribution in the corona. This is from 2012. And so the red lines there are showing where the corona is cool, about a million degrees. Uh, the green is showing where the corona is hotter, which is about 2 million degrees. And this has been repeated with other elements like uh, nickel, argon, really to characterize the dynamic properties of the corona. This is done by P.I. Habal and her team uh, from um, uh, Institute of Astronomy in Hawaii. Now, this is a picture uh, from this particular uh, eclipse, again showing uh, the continuum in iron 9 and iron 14, the 1 million degree plasma and the 2 million degree plasma. And if you go back and forth, you can see from 2012 to now, 
I mean, the corona is constantly evolving, but what this is showing us still is that we are not really still at solar minimum. The dipole field is still inclined. So we learn a lot from looking at eclipse uh, images. This is a picture uh, that was uh, created by Jay Pasakov and his associate. Uh, what you are seeing there, I mean, these were done almost immediately. And so the innermost image is from NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory, and then you have ground-based eclipse image from J, and then you have the outermost ring, which is from um, good old uh, Soho. And so you can see, you know, how these uh, features actually become streamlined. I mean, that, that's you're seeing sort of... Uh, uh, the shaping, the morphing of the coronal magnetic field, you know, uh, close to the surface of the sun, it is more bulby, and then it becomes actually narrower and tapered into current sheet. And this is what is carrying the solar wind into the interplanetary medium. And of course, we are part of that um, environment. This is a very interesting um, experiment. Uh, so this, is, this was actually led by Matt Penn, uh, who actually uh, set about 68 telescopes all across the path of totality, 68 of them. Citizen Kate, the full form of the uh, Kate uh, name is Continental America Telescopic Eclipse. This was 75% funded by private and corporate sponsors, and then the rest of it, I think, came from NASA. 260 volunteers, including 117 students from high school to graduate level, you know, who were manning this from 68 telescopes all the way from coast of Oregon to South Carolina, and they have incredible data. I think they have 61 of the telescopes actually took really good observations. Out of the 90 minutes, they have 82 minutes of solid data, and they are still anal And their interest was actually looking at the dynamic feature, looking at polar plumes, how it's uh, propagating out. And of course, there is so much data. There's a lot of work going on. Fascinating. Just imagine how many students, volunteers you engage. And these volunteers paid their own way to actually collect the data. It, it's uh, really unheard of. Then here we have something kind of, again, very interesting. Though they were originally designed to help monitor space shuttle launches, the telescopes and the jets on which these telescopes were mounted were a surprising boon for actually solar science. These instruments on that, um, on that telescope, on that uh, jet, essentially were uh, retrofitted, repurposed for solar science. This is WB57 platform, and there were two of them that flew, which essentially, again, looked at uh, magnetic waves, looked at the visible and infrared uh, corona, you know, flying at a height of about 50,000 feet, at a speed of about 470 miles per hour, and the, these two planes, and the one uh, on the right-hand side gives you the flight path of the two planes. They were able to, with these two planes, actually garner data for uh, roughly eight minutes when the eclipse was only sort of of the order of two minutes and 40 seconds. And of course, um, you know, since this is repurposed, I mean, there's a lot of calibration work going on, but they have actually taken um, really good data. So th these are some of this innovation that was going on. That was the first airborne, um, you know, solar science ever done. And now we are thinking of other ways of actually utilizing that platform that we would not have thought about without this uh, eclipse and all contributing to the greater understanding of heliophysics and therefore space weather. 
This is yet another, and I'm not going to talk about, of course, all of them. This is another very cool eclipse ballooning project that sent back live view of the August 21st eclipse from the edge of space. There were 55 of them. And again, these balloons and the sensors there were um, generated by high school students and college students. So we were also training sort of the next generation. So this project actually incorporated weather balloons from a dozen locations to, so there were 55 in all, dozen of them actually in different location. Um, they tried to picture, uh, you know, uh, sort of look at Earth's lower atmosphere, the part we interact with and which directly affects our weather. And how, this is called sort of the boundary layer, and you would know this better than I do, and how this layer actually reacted to the eclipse. And the data actually revealed that the planetary boundary layer uh, dropped down nearly to its nighttime altitude during the eclipse. And this is not the only group. There are other atmospheric scientists that have actually um, uh, been investigating this as well. Then there were several dozen of the eclipse balloons that flew cards. You see example of that right there, containing harmless bacteria to help us understand potential planetary contamination issues. I mean, we don't want to contaminate other planets when we send robots or even humans. So this was an attempt to sort of understand if microscopic life, like bacteria, for example, could survive on Mars. So how did the eclipse play a role? So in many ways, Earth's um, stratosphere is kind of similar to the environment on the surface of Mars, with only uh, one primary exception, and that is the amount of sunlight. But during the eclipse, the level of uh, sunlight dropped to something closer to what you might expect actually on Mars, providing the perfect environment to test the hardiness of these uh, potential Mars invaders. And work is going on on this. And I have five minutes. So <laughs> next is the ionosphere. And ionosphere is the region of Earth's atmosphere where particles are charged and it is affected both by Earth's weather from below and space weather from ab above, and it's kind of really sandwiched. And many communication signals pass through the ionosphere, so changes in this region can disrupt these signals. And so uh, there were some uh, prediction made about radio signals, how radio signals could go further during a total solar eclipse because the ionosphere is less ionized. And uh, this prediction actually uh, matched very well with the observation. And that is kind of really significant. Validating this model of the ionosphere is a step towards understanding sort of less predictable changes in the ionosphere that can impact the reliability of our communications and navigation signals. This is sort of looking at Earth's radiation budget. This is a picture from uh, EPIC camera on Discover and during the totality. The moon, of course, completely blocks direct solar radiation and dramatically decreasing the total amount of radiation that reaches the surface, as well as the radiation that is reflected back into space by Earth's atmosphere, ocean, clouds, all of that. So this was an experiment, a control experiment, to kind of treat the eclipse as a giant cloud, impenetrable cloud, because the computer models are sophisticated to work with different clouds and kind of figure out the amount of uh, um, radiation that was reflected back. And what they found is that scientists saw a 10% drop in reflected light during the eclipse, whereas during uh, ordinary non-eclipse days, that variation is only uh, 1%. This is an instrument that flew on the Gulf 3 um, airplane, uh, measuring radiation doses. And this is actually uh, a very important and significant step 
in terms of establishing some baseline. I'm not going to go into details. I'm almost there. This is a picture from Storm Center. They delivered live interviews to WJLA, the St. Clair Broadcast Groups, Washington, D.C., NBC affiliate, and many, many other local weather news channels. And this was phenomenal, actually. We spent significant amount of time trying to explain both uh, before the eclipse, after the eclipse, not during the eclipse. Finally, I think I had sort of one goal when I was given this charge to lead the solar eclipse. And my goal was how do I take the notion, the idea of eclipse to every American. This was an all-American eclipse, you know, whether you were in the path of totality or not. I mean, you were touched by the eclipse. And that was completely taken care of by one swoop, essentially by the US Postal Service. They generated this uh, thermochromic ink stamp. If you don't have it, you can still get it online. Here, if you put actually your body heat on the black part of the uh, moon's uh, disk or solar disk, what you get is the next image, and that is the silhouette of the moon's surface. And this is sort of on June 24th, we unveiled uh, the first day cover of this tan. Um, this was my sort of wishes for a happy 2018 to everyone. You know, a total solar eclipse is beautiful beyond compare. So the t sight of the total solar eclipse of the sun is not just a scientific inquiry. Many found it hard to express what they were feeling. And this is, I think, true of, for all of us after witnessing this most beautiful sight on Earth. For many, it was an emotional and even spiritual moment, and one that transcends daily events of our normal life. This new year, I wanted people to make a resolution to see at least one total solar eclipse of the sun. And finally, I kind of want to end with this slide. This is my last slide. And this is ingenuity of humankind. You know, we do not depend on nature alone. The eclipse was provided to us by nature. But we are actually going to send the first spacecraft to a star originally named as Solar Probe Plus, but to honor Eugene Parker, who actually theorized the existence of solar wind. This has been named uh, to Parker Solar Probe. This spacecraft is going to go to within 10 solar radii of the sun in that coronal mess that we just saw during the solar eclipse, and the corona is hot. And we are going to actually take in situ measurement of the local environment of the plasma of the magnetic field. This mission is, has been led by APL, Applied Physics Lab, who's actually produced the spacecraft and will be launching end of July, beginning of August this year. Thank you. Lika, thank you very much. I know we have several questions here in the audience, uh, and we'll check to see if we have any online. And also, uh, we have a few minutes. I would love to hear from some of you in the audience, uh, broadcast meteorologists, on how you handled the eclipse. And what did you do to cover it? Uh, because it was just a spectacular, spectacular event. Frank? Uh, thank you, Frank Billingsley from Houston. I can tell you the answer to that was we sent someone to St. Louis, a reporter. Uh, and then covered it from there, uh, and then in Houston. Uh, thank you. I, have you ever, are you familiar with the Weather Research Center and Dr. Jill Hassling's work at all? I, and and I'll, 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 I'll just say my question. Uh, she has been around a long time forecasting uh, tropical systems. Uh, her father before her, John Freeman, um, he was uh, somewhat a colleague of, of Bill Gray. She does very well with her forecasting. Um, she had 70% that Texas would be hit this year. 70% of the west coast of Florida would be hit, 30% for the east coast of Florida. So the proof's in the pudding to some degree. She's as good as anybody else out there. But her primary methodology 
is sunspots and sun energy and the, almost a linear equation. Have you ever heard of that kind of research? And, and if so, do, do you make anything uh, of it? Yes, yes, of course. I mean, that's where all solar physicists began. And as we understand more, so sunspots is essentially just a number, right? It depends on how you quantify what a spot is. It is OK to count spots when you are in the maximum phase, because you have so many that the uncertainty is small. But when you actually go to the rock bottom, what is a sunspot? So it's not a physical number. It is a manifestation of something. And so we can only, you know, when we use proxy methods, it works OK. But we can't pull any physics out of it in that sense. But people are using sunspot, use looking at total solar irradiance and creating proxy methods. But we're still trying to understand, you know, what does it mean? Dr. Lika, Matt Safino from Portland, Oregon. Um, so first to answer Dave's question, we had, uh, since we were first contact in North America for the eclipse, um, we had people stretching and going live for our TV station from the Oregon coast to the Willamette Valley, interviewing with Dr. Lika in Salem, several people in Central Oregon as well. We started at 4 in the morning and went live, because totality for us was around 10.20. So we started with our morning news at 4.30, and we stayed on continuously until 12.30. And then, of course, did our evening news as well. So it was a big, big deal for us um, for the total solar eclipse. And thanks for being a part of that. Couple questions for you. Um, this new solar probe, when it launches, does that basically just dive into the sun and get destroyed at the end of its mission? And the second question is, is there anything about GO-16 that you're excited about in terms of using for studying the sun? So um, uh, it, it sounds like a kamikaze mission, right? the Parker Solar Probe. I mean, it kind of seems like it's diving in, and it is, actually. Um, it, it's, um, it's over seven year time frame that it is diving in to the 10 solar radii uh, frame. So it kind of goes around Venus to get gravity assist and progressively pushes itself closer and closer. No, it's not a kamikaze mission. Uh, this is a mission we have thought of for almost 50 years, ever since Parker theorized there is solar wind. But it's taken this long, really, to have the technology in hand to actually send a probe. And the technology is not all that um, um, sophisticated in that we didn't know about it. It's it's carbon, carbon uh, shield, sandwich, cone shape. You know, all the instruments are um, under the shadow of that cone. So it, it's actually a very clever, uh, ingenious uh, engineering, I would say, that is making this possible. It's an eight-year mission, seven plus one. Seven is the prime uh, phase of this mission, because it will take it that long to get to 10 solar radii. But then it's going to come back out and continue on if the spacecraft survives. Um, uh, go yes, please. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Bob Rillage from the Space Weather Prediction Center with NOAA, and I will cover GO-16. And I think the main theme for that is, yes, there are some improvements, better imager, better resolution, uh, things of that nature. But the main theme is continuity for us is maintaining all of the critical observations we get uh, from that today. So we are going to be able to do some, some new things with respect to um, satellite environment uh, for some of the satellites, but continuity. Um, but certainly improvement across the board. And, and one comment while well, I've got the mic, and I know I get 90 minutes here shortly, but with respect to hurricane forecasting in the sunspot cycle, I have not looked at that. I certainly will. Um, one note is that in the last solar minimum, as Lika pointed out, we had 400 days of no sunspots. So I guess my question would be, as I looked at those algorithms and methodologies, is what do you do with that? Um, you know, you certainly don't predict no hurricane. So I will look at that, but I'm, I'm not aware of the work. Thank that's a very good point, yes. Jennifer? Hi, Dr. Leica. Jennifer Ocavina from Paducah, Kentucky. We were in uh, totality. In fact, most of the viewing area was in totality from SIU um, and Carbondale, where NASA was set up, down through Paducah, and then Hopkinsville was also in our viewing area as well. So 
Uh, we had a lot of traffic issues as well as communication concerns. But for our coverage and to answer Dave's question there, I'm really proud of uh, some of the advanced storytelling that we did to help prepare the public. Um, thanks to the presentations you guys gave last year and um, previous years, we already knew this was on the radar and coming our way. So um, the whole entire news operation uh, months in beforehand started planning. So we did put together a web page that included a countdown, also links to stories, um, and then NASA links, and then we also taught viewers how to view it safely. We did a 30-minute special two days before to kind of highlight the phenomenon that you would experience or things to look for during the eclipse from how it would feel like on other planets as you get closer to eclipse to the diamond ring and of course how to view it safely and when to take the glasses off. Uh, we did a lot of school visits to show kids how to make viewing boxes so that they might be prepared if they weren't able to get the glasses. Uh, we did give glasses out for the station. We did web episodes with Lou Mayo. He came and answered some questions and viewers asked questions. We allowed that. Uh, that was about a month ahead of time. And then during the eclipse, we started early and grabbed the feed from NASA, the uh, live feed, and showed it at the bottom of the screen as it started in Oregon. And then as it transversed the United States over to the Carolinas. Uh, we did not go live at the station during because we wanted everybody at the station to be able to go outside and experience it. So we left the live feed up so that you could see it that way. Um, we did a lot of backyard experiments where we did a countdown and here's what you're going to see next kind of thing and here's what to look for. We did the shadow snakes, the, um, the shadow, what? Shadow bands. Shadow bands. Um, we were able to capture those in the backyard. That's um, very hard. Yes. You were lucky. We had some white tables set up so that we could try and capture that. And of course we had uh, a reporter live in Carbondale with NASA and uh, kind of doing the play-by-play -play beforehand. And of course the stadium was full. That was neat to see a stadium full of people watching. And then um, other people from Hopkinsville and, and other areas. We did kind of a uh, Challenger Learning Center is in Paducah. And so Terry Wilcott was an astronaut from Kentucky who did the play-by-play -play for people that were lucky enough to get a spot there and watch it as well so we got all our astronauts to be in their hometown yeah <laughs> it was fun but it was definitely an experience and uh, I was able to capture some photography during it as well um, and it was it was amazing so I, I have a question and a comment uh, thank you very much for sharing this uh, my question is um, I, I am thinking of um, you know putting another round of eclipse proposals and i'd like to know from you if you have you know data um, that could be utilized for science citizen science uh, you know if you would be willing to provide us with access one, once i go through with this process would be very helpful and i'm just sharing this because there's so much that has gone on you know it's hard to kind of uh, keep track of that the second thing is that you have described kind of a really pull up sort of plan and how you executed it. I was at the uh, National uh, Transportation Board uh, meeting. They had two eclipse sessions yeah. last week. And so we started talking about, you know, going forward for 2024. So I think we kind of need to think about uh, writing some of these experiences up so that you know we can share this globally, prepare more. I mean, uh, clearly something has been ignited in the consciousness of people. And I kind of early on used to call this eclipse a generational eclipse. So the young people who saw this will be carrying the you know torch for sure. the 2024 eclipse. And so we, I think, really need to think about utilizing this time. For this eclipse, it came like that shadow, 10,000 times darker in one minute. I mean, we didn't have that much time to prepare, and we did pretty well. Um, and if we can prepare for future, that would be really great. Just a quick question. What is the duration? Is it expected to be longer 
for the 2024? I, yes, I think it's about, I'm not 100% sure minutes. of the order of maybe four minutes in places, a okay. little yeah, bit longer. Carbondale is, of course, in Paducah, yes. in it again, so we're kind of looking forward to no clouds. Fingers crossed in April, we'll see. Thanks to all of you meteorologists, this was a perfect day, 21st of August. Couldn't have done without that. Kent Earhart from St. Louis. Uh, we did a lot of the things that the Jennifer station did and a lot of the other stations did as well. I won't go into all of that. I was very happy to see everybody jump on board early um, with coverage and, and uh, explaining what we were going to be seeing weeks ahead of time and building up to it. Uh, the economical impact to some of the communities where people were traveling was a big uh, subject of a lot of our stories. Some of the smaller communities were seeing influx of, of tourists that they'd never seen uh, that magnitude. But the thing that stood out to me the most and that I, I guess I wasn't quite uh, prepared for was the emotional response of a lot of the people that were, that were driven to tears by just the magnitude of what they were experiencing and, and we'd catch them on mic, even our own reporters in some cases. Uh, that really to me was the most overwhelming part and it was that right at the end when we were, everybody was nervous about the coverage, we gotta get this right, all the technical aspect of, of everything, but everybody was so emotionally uh, driven, it, it, it really, I was really taken back by that. Wasn't quite ready for that. And you know, I tried to say this, you have to be there, experience yeah. it, Absolutely. to know it. Uh, Jim Gandy, uh, WLTX in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, we had the same experiences except for one thing. Uh, the zoo requested that I be at the zoo for the eclipse. So we made that happen. And we were doing reports the whole day. What was happening at our zoo was that they, one of their researchers, uh, had uh, gotten the, the funds to do a study. And so he was, uh, he was monitoring 12 different species at the zoo. And um, the experiment, uh, the eclipse was on Monday, the experiment started on Friday, so that they could have a baseline of animal behavior. And once it got to the eclipse, as the eclipse started, as we were heading toward totality, the animal behavior began to change for some of them. Uh, there's a species of monkey uh, that they have at the zoo where it, um, it's, it, it, the males just kept getting louder and louder and louder and louder. We actually had a uh, video provided to us of this. And as soon as totality occurred, they stopped. Of course, then you could hear the humans in the background. <laughs> uh, but also, I was positioned at the sea lion exhibit. And the sea lions, you know, were their normal behavior until totality. When it got dark, they just went crazy. And they continued to be agitated until the eclipse ended. That was two and a half minutes later. And the whole time during uh, totality, you can hear the, uh, uh, the sea lions just barking their heads off there. Um, the researcher is in the process of cataloging, uh, cataloging all of the behavior changes and we'll be uh, publishing this in peer review uh, journals. So this is very interesting. So, you know, I'm th thinking, were there any other large mammals that you're aware of that behave? I'm wondering whether it is a function of cognition. Well, um, it, they were, there were, there <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> just me. Uh, there, were, uh, there were 12 species and he got uh, significant reactions from eight of them. Um, and when I interviewed him after the eclipse, uh, <laughs> he was kind of like a kid in a candy store because um, these were reactions that had never been documented. So we really didn't know what to expect. And so uh, and from that standpoint, uh, it, was, it was unusual. It was, and, and the thing about it is, he, would, he was really conscientious. Uh, he had gone through the literature, and you know, they, this just had not been documented before. I'm going to a zoo next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lika, thank you very much. This has been amazing. Thank you.